the 10th edition. And I have 9th edition numbers on here. Somehow I managed to lose what I did y'all student stuff off of. It's very distressing, but I'll do it again. But um, your stuff is correct. Do you have 10th edition page numbers on your student stuff? At least that's what they told me this morning. So, uh, I wrote it up here. Pages, yeah, 38 to 40. Yeah, I don't have the book put on there. Chapter 38 is kind of a review chapter of the neurological system, and I'm going to start with it. Just do a little bit to refresh your memory. And, um, uh, there is, and the other thing about, for some reason, I love this new edition. It's, it's much more concise and gives you what you need to know. But <laughs> they left out my city of Providence. They gave me one paragraph on trigeminal neuralgia, one paragraph on Bill's palsy. So I'm going to give you what you need on those. ATI, book, med surge, uh, Oh, that's intimidating. Oh. <laughs> um, as, uh, you can also look in your ATI book because a lot of this is covered in your ATI book. Uh, but somebody said, well, my CD gravis isn't that you know, common anymore. And I'm like, I know four people that have that. So it's still on our POI. We are still teaching it. Still, it's still being tested. So I'm while I do that book. Uh, so we'll talk about it. You'll have what you need for that. Um, let's see. Oh, ADC five. Y'all are Miss Tucker. Two thirty main lobby. Is that what she told you? No, she hasn't told you anything. Two thirty main lobby. <laughs> Uh, have y'all been to Enterprise? I When you go down the hill, you know, by the hospital, you just keep going to the back parking lot on the right, and then walk back up the hill, <laughs> go in the main entrance. Bring your N95s, everybody. Um, when I met with the, uh, the education lady last week, they're not requiring N95s unless you go into a room with a COVID patient. All the COVID patients have been on that end of the hall, but the hall was full. She said the other thing is when you go into, if your patient is getting anything aerosol, a breathing treatment, you should wear an N95 for 30 minutes afterwards. So I just figure we need to wear an N95 because we all know. Is the hospital, um, is it like is the uh, patient in filter capacity? At all? Last week they were full. Okay. Their ICU beds were full with five ventilators and they had full patients on three and four. Now I read some, an article this morning in the Dustin paper that Alabama's hospitalizations have decreased by like 50% over the last week. So that could be happening in our hospital too. So, uh, but at two, my group, you are meeting me, um, we'll just meet in the front lobby too and then I'll walk you around to the other place. Um, we're, but both of y'all are doing, my group is doing glucometer stuff at two. Y'all don't let me forget that. I've been known to do that. And Ms. Tucker's group, is, he's staying and doing y'all at 2.30. Uh, and then Ms. Sullivan, Flowers Hospital. Yes, ma'am. I have no idea. Four, four north. <laughs> Four North. And are y'all a day group? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm assuming she's going to meet you in the lobby. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Did y'all talk to her already? Yeah, she yes. was here last right. week. Yes, ma'am. Okay, mm -hmm. so y'all already know where you're going. Right. Uh, I'm going to be doing documentation, working on that. So I would say all y'all need to bring that to clinical. Don't forget your medicine cards. There's three. They were renal. Y'all should already have them done while you were studying for this test. <laughs> and <laughs> so hand them to your instructor in the morning. Um, and then y'all will get started in clinical, and it's going to be great. Where's my little group? My little group is right. Right. We're getting 
breakfast in the morning. Did I tell y'all that? I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> she told me it was going to be like a good breakfast, not just bad. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Juan. You want to go to ours? Is that what? You oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well. That's weight gain, not weight loss, right? Okay, yeah, they're the ones that come in looking like they're in, yeah, they're positive. We had a select all that apply. And it was, um, I, I clicked, I didn't click weight loss because they usually come okay, in. Okay, so they're on the products that come in for weight yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Think neuro. <laughs> Shifting one. <laughs> and the thing about all of these, this module is easy and it's hard. It's easy because these are our major concepts. Mobility, comfort and pain, safety, sensory perception, amenities, cognition. Well, y'all have already reviewed all that. You know how to take care of an immobile patient. Uh, you know the kind of things to do for safety. You know what to do when somebody's confused, right? But the thing that makes this hard is that we've got about seven different disease processes. And they all affect, they all have similar symptoms. So students tend to get them a little bit confused. So, and I didn't get a chance to look between classes. I used to, I used to teach this module, then Ms. Wise came, she taught it, so I'm back at it. And I had a little prep sheet for y'all that I want you to do between now and next week to get ready for class for a couple of reasons. It'll help you review and get you ready, but this is also a whirlwind module because Ms. Daniels and I are splitting three days because it's two short modules, but I mean, it's very doable, the information, but it can be a little overwhelming for us trying to get through everything and let you know what we want. So I really do want you to prepare for class next week so that you won't be going, what? What are you talking about? Um, and I think in that prep I have a little chart where you can put Parkinson's, MG, Gillian Barre, and put the main patho on it so that you can look at them all sitting there and kind of distinguish, because there's distinguishing characteristics for all of this stuff, okay? And we're going to start off talking about, first off, just reviewing the central nervous system, because the central nervous system is, is, you know, the brain, the spinal cord, the brain is our little computer, our, I don't know what all those terms are, but it runs the show. It does everything, and it's real, um, important for the brain to be working correctly, for everything to be going right, and it's kind of like the switchboard for the body. It receives information, comes up through the spinal cord, it's chapter 38, comes up through the spinal cord, tells the brain what's going on, receives information from the environment, and then makes a decision about how to interpret and act on that information. Now. Within that, we have the peripheral nervous system, which is the spinal nerves, the cranial nerves, and the autonomic nervous system. So there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves, there's 12 cranial nerves. Those nerves go out and get information, bring it back to the spinal cord. And they all have different areas of the body. These are dermatones. Well, no, this is the nerve. Your, your book has a picture very similar to this, which actually has the dermatomes marked off. And that's just where those nerves innervate, okay? Peripheral nervous system tells us, like if I were to touch something hot, it's gonna tell me, hey, dummy, get your hand off there, okay? So it's got messengers that go to the back to the spinal cord, up to the brain that says, she's going to burn her skin off. And it sends it back down and says, move, move it. Well, by that time, my hand's burned. So these are instantaneous, very quick. 
And what does that is that central, that main component of our nervous system, the neuron. We're going to look at a neuron in just a minute. But let's just refresh the autonomic nervous system. These are the, this is a system that works no matter what you tell it. Your heart is going to beat however many times a minute, no matter, you know. You, there are some people that can use biofeedback and stuff, but normally your heart's beating, your stomach's digesting, your gut's, uh, you know, doing its thing. That's all autonomic, automatic, okay? And it's divided into sympathetic and parasympathetic. The sympathetic is that fight or flight. Something just happened bad. Somebody's walking toward me with a gun. My heart rate goes up. My pupils dilate. I am getting ready to fight or I'm getting the hell out of here. Okay? <laughs> but I'm getting my body is getting ready. I don't need to worry about that big meal I just ate, except I'm not going to be able to breathe when I'm running. <laughs> but I don't need to worry about digesting it. I don't need to worry about my bladder being full. I've got to pee because I probably already peed when I saw the gun. <laughs> But that is your fight or flight, okay? The parasympathetic is your feed and breed, digestion, reproduction. All right, so when I had that big meal and I sit down in front of my TV and I'm not worried about somebody chasing me, then my parasympathetic takes over and starts digesting my food, okay? Those are involuntary controls, involuntarily controlled. Now, unfortunately, as we get older, definitely not there yet, our brain, you know, shrinks a little bit, just like we talked about our kidneys. But it doesn't affect our intellect. It doesn't really affect those kind of things, but it may take us a little bit longer to process time, process things. Um, changes in perception of pain. We may have a few more aches and pains that we didn't that didn't bother us when we were younger. Okay, um, it's not necessarily a sign of changes in our intelligence or neurological degeneration. It's just your brain's getting a little bit older. The whole brain, spinal cord, nerves—you've been working them hard for 75 years, and they're slowing down a little bit. Um, Sensory perception, maybe not as good. You'll see some elderly patients that um, get, if you ha ask them to close their eyes and stand on one leg, they might start kind of leaning a little bit because their sense of surrounding their pro, pro I can't say that word. Well, I don't, oh, I don't see it on here, but that pro, I can't say it, I'll say it in a minute. <laughs> That sense of your surroundings. Appropriate. Yeah, appropriate. Appropriate. yeah, that's it. What she said. That's mm -hmm. it. <laughs> Starts to diminish just a little bit. We, uh, they tend to sleep more. They may get up at early, early in the morning. I know my grandma, when she came to see us, she'd go to bed at 8 o'clock. She'd be up at 4 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> Some of that was because that's when she always got up to go to work, to get ready for work. Because she had to walk to her work and it, it was about two miles. Um, so our sleeping pattern will change, but they kind of need a little more sleep like your youngsters do. Do you have teenagers? Anybody has teenagers? They sleep a lot, don't they? No. <laughs> <laughs> Mine would stay up at night, but then they'd sleep till noon, you know. Um, and it's just that they really do need a little more sleep at that age because the brain's changing and growing and everything is, you know, growing. So some changes occur as we get older. So those can, these disease processes can exacerbate those things. Now, this morning I found out I haven't gone over this with y'all yet, so I guess it's going to happen in New Day. But let's talk a minute about the neurons and how the spine sends out and does messages, okay? Those cranial nerves, how do they work? Well, that neuron is our main guy, and what happens is an electrical transmission comes along it, 
And let's say this one is going to, because we're going to talk about muscles. These are neuromuscular diseases we're going to be talking about. So the axon of one comes along, and it's either going to connect with another one to keep that transmission going, or it's going to come along here and get on this muscle fiber, and it's going to transmit neurotransmitters. It's going to send neurotransmitters out there to say, hey, you need to contract, or hey, you need to settle down, whatever. But it talks, these neurons send out, first the impulse comes down, and then when it gets to where it's going, the neurotransmitter comes out to tell what we need to do. So this is a neuron. And this is the axon part of it. And another neuron is sitting right here. And it's going to hook up and say, hey, this is what we're sending along. And these neurotransmitters are going to jump out like getting on a train at a train station. You get off one, you wait for the next one, door opens, you get on that one, you go to the next station. Door opens, you get off, you come to the train, you get on. Have it, this all was happening, boom, 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 boom. So these little things right here, this is a myelin sheath. Um, it is protection. All those neurons are there, and that sheath is around it to protect it. And if something happens to that sheath, then that transmission can occur. And so with these neurons that are going to muscles, the muscle doesn't work right. You look confused. It'll get better. <laughs> All right, so let's go to the next slide. I think it's my better one. Yeah, okay. So here is my neuron. Here's my axon, and here is that myelin sheet wrapped around it. And you see there's little spaces here. They're called nodes of Renvier. You don't have to know that. Just, but see, it looks kind of like sausage links. And what this does, if this myelin is intact, it says, hey, jump on by, jump on by. That's what makes it go so fast. And then we get down here to um, where it's going to attach to the next one. And that's called a synapse. And here we go. Here's our axon. It gets to the end. and. There sits all my neurotransmitters, waiting for that impulse to come, come down so we can tell this next neuron what we're doing. So here's everything. My impulse comes. It's activated. It goes over here to release it. And this area is a synaptic cleft. Don't worry about names of things. I just want you to understand the concept because this is how you'll understand why the meds work, okay? So, let's say my neurotransmitter is dopamine. And I got all this dopamine out here. And this neuron, the dendrite part of it, is sitting here with these dopamine receptor sites saying, come on down, tell me what to do. So my dopamine attaches and shoots off the message. Now, after it's done its job, it'll unattach so another dopamine can get on there. And a couple of things can happen. It can be reuptaked. I don't know if that's a verb or not, but that's what we call it. It's reuptaked back here to sit in its little vesicle and wait for another transmission. Or either there's an enzyme that destroys whatever this is. Now, monoamine oxidase is one of the enzymes. Um, Co-methyl transferase, blah, 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 blah. C-O-N-T is one of these enzymes. And it will come up here and say, hey, you already done your job. You're dead. Boom, you're dead. So when that happens, I now have less of the dopamine I was using in this space. Which in a normal person, that's okay. Because another transmission is going to come along. Boom, we're going to attach. Boom, off it goes. And everything works great. But with a lot of these diseases, that transmitter or the receptor site is being affected. Okay? Muddy is water. 
We'll talk about this some more when we get to the myths. But just know that this transmission across here is very important to send the correct signals. To, we're talking muscles today. To those muscles to tell them what to do. And if there's not enough of it, then either the wrong signal gets sent or no signal gets sent. Okay? So, we're going to talk about Parkinson's and we're going to talk about headaches. I hope we'll get there. The dementia, you are going to talk, you had that last semester. We're going to go into a few more things with it when, uh, for your prep for respite. And hopefully in two weeks we will be in respite. So that will not be on your Module G test, rest the dementia part, but it will be on your final. Okay? So when it comes time for you to go to respite, there is prep material for you to do, and that discussion will be part of your final information you need to know. So today, we're going to do Parkinson's. And I know this page number's wrong, but um, I think y'all have the correct one. So I know I did it. I just can't find it anywhere. I did it at home, and I've been all through my laptop. I cannot find it. All right. So this is a neuromuscular problem, and it is a progressive degenerative disease. It is characterized, it causes great disability for patients. And I know, what's the first thing y'all think of when you think of Parkinson's? Tremors. Tremors. And that's one of the biggies. Tremors, the rigidity, akinesia, bradykinesia, and postural instability. Now, I have, I know, well, I know several people with Parkinson's. One of them is my one of my best friend's sister. She was diagnosed at the age of, she was in her early 40s. So she's an early uh, onset patient. And she did not start out with tremors at all. They did not know what was going on with her. It took them a while to diagnose her. But she has progressed very rapidly. She was having a lot of fall. And then the other one is my mother, who was in her 70s, early 70s, before she was diagnosed. But I have a feeling now that once I started learning about Parkinson's, I really think she started exhibiting signs in her 60s. And her first thing was lack of smell. And unfortunately, there's not any tests that we can take and go, oh, you got Parkinson's. <laughs> We got to rule out other neurological diseases, which is what they tried to do with her nose. <laughs> Never could figure out why she couldn't smell and until she got Parkinson's, until her tremors started. Um, and then we look at symptoms. So, this goes through the symptoms in early stages. Early on, reduce right arm swing, and notice his step length is shorter on one side. This one has decreased left arm swing. That only one arm is swinging normally, the other one's just kind of hanging there. Their gait slows. He's leaning forward a little bit. And again, arm swing asymmetrical. As the disease progresses, there is bilateral reduction in that arm swing. Bradykinesia starts. Their postural control and stability gets worse. They begin to develop that shuffling, those shuffling steps and that stooped posture. And in the advanced stages, Bradykinesia, postural control, stability is definitely affected, and they have trouble with those turns. 
Notice how she kind of turns in place. And they will develop freezing. I think this is the one that has the guy trying to do two things. Okay, yeah. And when they're they have dual tasks, like he's trying to carry that tray, that that really gets him into that freezing gate where their their body his body's not quite sure what to do here. He can't do both things. He's having trouble initiating his gait, which is very common for them. <clears throat> they can't get started. And a lot of times they seem to get faster and faster, which is a safety issue. Freezing of gait during initiation. Just can't quite get it going. So very definite changes in gait. And this one, I don't know how this guy does it. Take me to the forest. <laughs> this gate is the gate that is a hypokinetic gate. Um, the prototype uh, is Parkinson's, um, or Parkinsonian type of gate in which the patient will have a posture which will be stooped over, leaning forward, and then will have difficulty as far as initiating gait. When the gait is initiated, there are small steps. Oftentimes there's a, there's a tremor associated with this. And as the gait progresses, there may be a picking up of speed or what's called a fenestrated gait. And then in turning, instead of having a normal turning, the patient will turn on block, which means they'll turn almost as a statue moving around. And then, again, having difficulty starting and the marsh getting popped. I don't know how it does that. That is an excellent <laughs> example of that gait. So just seeing that, you can see where there are stability issues. There are risks for falls. There are a lot of problems that come from that gait. Tremor, rigidity, akinesia, bradykinesia, postural instability, they're, they're kind of trapped. You know, they want to stand up straight, but their body, that's what their body has given them. Okay. And this happens because of an imbalance of neurotransmitters. The major one is dopamine. All right. Dopamine is a calming transmitter, and acetylcholine is an excitatory transmitter. I will show you that in just a second. I forgot about Michael here. So, my friend in the 40s. Normally, this disease uh, occurs between, probably the most common is 60 and up, okay? Um, Michael J., do you know this guy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Back to the Future. Well, before that, he was a television star when he was a teenager, early 20s probably. And during that time, when he was really getting popular, he was diagnosed with Parkinson's in his 30s. He has been an advocate ever since. He has michaeljfox.org is a foundation that keeps up with Parkinson's research. And I go there a lot just to see what new things are going on with Parkinson's. And he was probably the first person, he came totally off of his meds and spoke before Congress about the effects of Parkinson's. There was a lot of controversy at the time about fetal tissue transplants and things, and um, Congress was trying to decide about that, and he also went on Johnny Carson, um, you know, and just, he had pretty significant tremors without his medicines. So, um, it is some hereditary in there. Also, genetics 
uh, well water, chemical exposures, just different things they've seen that can lead to this. But it's fairly common, million people, uh, these were quotes out of your, your new book, and uh, it does affect men a little more than women, but not a whole lot. African Americans don't seem to get Parkinson's very often. Um, and as I said, it's generally a later disease, but when you do have early onset, those patients' prognoses are usually not as good. And part of that is due to the medications that we use, side effects, the body gets used to them, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, he's done really well. My friend's sister, not so much. Um, she now has Lewy body, is getting the first signs of Lewy body dementia, which is common, a common type of dementia with uh, patients with Parkinson's, especially those early onset Parkinson's. Um, <laughs> this is so weird. Uh, this is what we're supposed to do. Dopamine and acetylcholine. Dopamine is inhibitory, acetylcholine is excitatory, and they balance each other out. And I don't know what it does, but for some reason this made a mirror image. I need you to fix it. <laughs> this is dopamine, too low. This is ACH, acetylcholine, too high. So if you've got this on your PowerPoint, please change it. This ACH should be up here, and the dopamine should be down here. I've never seen that happen, but see, it's, it's a mirror image. In the, I, I don't know what I did. I'm sure it's an uh, operator error on my part. So the excitatory acetylcholine is stimulating muscles, and that is actually what causes the rigidity because the muscles get so exhausted and they're, they get tight, they get, that's that mask-like face that they develop. And then you, the uh, dopamine is low. So some other effects of that imbalance is that they have reduced sympathetic nervous system, so it affects their heart rate and blood pressures, which can be a little labile. They develop, uh, it's common for them to have orthostatic hypotension, you know, even if they're not on a drug that causes it. And um, this also causes them to have mood changes. They can have depression, mood swings, anxiety, and the uh, Autonomic nervous system is also affected which, uh, by increasing salivation, causes them to drool. As their muscles weaken, they can't swallow as well. And they have increased incidence of nocturia and having to get up at night. There are five stages. This is not the right page, but it's on your notes correctly. In um, stage one, they have that unilateral limb involvement, so like at the beginning of that video where he's swinging one arm and the other one is not swinging so much. <coughs> they have minimal weakness. They may or may not have some hand and arm trembling, but it's minimal. In the second stage, bilateral limb movements now are affected. They're both of their arms don't swing well. They're developing that mask-like face from the rigidity, and they're developing that slow shuffling gait. Stage three, their postural instability gets worse. Their gait gets worse, so they're becoming more of a risk of falling, a safety hazard. Stage four, akinesia, more rigidity, and by the time they reach stage five, they are totally dependent on someone else. So, um, you know, they, they go through these stages, and as I learned this, I, I looked back at my mom, 
And uh, you know, when I came home from college, I get so tickled because I think uh, my dad used to, they sat like here and here and watched the TV over here. And uh, my mom was sitting here and I hear dad going, what are you mad at me about now? <laughs> I'm not mad, I'm watching TV. She had developed that mask face. And this was kind of before we knew. Because she started with the smell and then her face started getting that mask. And when she started trembling, it was just her foot. Well, how many of you do this? <laughs> so nobody thought a thing about it, you know, until it progressed. Um, so patient family education is really important, you know, for them to understand these stages that these patients go through. So it is a motor disease. It affects motor function. But it also has non-motor symptoms. Here's my decreased ability to smell. Uh, the hypo orthostatic hypotension. Pain and discomfort, which we get a little more of as we get older. They're more sensitive to that. Uh, emotions, sleep problems, constipation. They're not walking out as much. Uh, bladder, skin, all of those things. So it is a lot of this, but also non-motor things as well. Now when you see that, if you think about seeing that guy in those final stages when he was trembling and doing all that, uh, my first thought might be they need a wheelchair. I don't, I don't want them to fall. We don't want a hip broken. And it's probably one of the worst things you can do for a Parkinson's patient. They need to be as independent as they can for as long as they can. And the family has to be really aware and very acute to helping them with safety, but not making them feel like a baby. Because the minute they get that wheelchair, they tend to go downhill cognitively too. So we don't want them, we don't want them to get hurt, break a hip or anything like that, but we've got to promote their self-esteem, their self-worth, because this disease kind of takes it away from them. Um, so bradycnesia, the slowness of the walking, the resistance to movement, the rigidity, the masked face, the freezing where they, they can initiate. One thing that helps initiation is to kind of rock back and forth. And I've got another thing I'll show you in a minute that's really cool. Um, the rigidity causes that masked face. You know, that's Mohammed Ali. And trauma, um, closed head trauma is is a secondary cause of Parkinson's symptoms. Uh, and they, they talk a lot about he probably has had primary Parkinson's, but also had a lot of close head injury from his, his uh, what he did for a living. Um, but uh, he, he kind of joined in with Michael Fox as his Parkinson's worsened. Okay, so y'all don't have this. You can take a picture if you want to, but it just kind of recaps what we've been talking about. Okay, usually over 50, I'd say probably over 60. The mask face, the stoop posture, pill roller. Sometimes their tremor is just where their fingers do this. Um, commonly, the tremors start in the hands and the arm. Occurs most often at rest. Um, generally, they don't tremor when they're asleep. It does increase with stress as they're trying to do something intentionally. The tremors can worsen. They develop this little microphagia way of writing, really tiny. Um, the bradykinesia, their arm swings. One arm stops, then both as it progresses. Bleaking of the eyelids. Now, a lot of times they'll have uh, increased secretions from their eyes or runny nose. 
that goes along with the increase in the drooling and the salivation. Um, muscle rigidity, jerky slow movements, and uh, the cognition, the mental is depression, anxiety, those kind of things. So you can see that this is a lot of, about working those muscles, range of motion, keeping them safe, and working with those patients. There's no lab test, so we find out what's going on by ruling out other things. They look for a tumor that might have been affecting my mom's smell. You know, we look for all kinds of things. Uh, but you finally, when all the other symptoms started developing, figured it out. And that's, that's pretty much the way we go with this, because there is no blood test at this time. So what is our goal with these patients? There's no cure at this time either. <clears throat> but we want to maintain optimum mobility. So we want them walking with somebody to help them in case they get falling. Um, but we want them doing as much as they possibly can. We want to keep them from getting side effects from being immobile or decreasing mobility. So we're going to try to help their constipation. We don't want them to get any kind of bed sores. We're going to work with nutrition. Um, we're going to help them, but we're going to let them do as much for themselves as they can. And there will come a point, my friend's sister is, oh Lord, we went, I don't think she's in a wheelchair yet, but she went from falling a lot the first six months. She was very unstable. And uh, finally the medicines, they got a combination of meds that helped with that. But she eventually needed to use a cane, which she absolutely hated. And she, I mean, this woman is in her 40s. You're giving her a cane. And um, so that took quite a while. I think now we're on a walker. Which she also, but she'll she'll go in the kitchen and do something, and then walk out <laughs> and leave everything in the kitchen that helps her to get around. Um, and with the onset of a little of the Lewy body dementia, she's having she's having even more problems with that. Um, but letting them do as much as they can, patients will maintain a positive self esteem, and that's what it's all about keeping them mobile, keeping them as active as they can possibly be. Alright, so I've got a lot of math and myth classifications here, and we're going to go over each one, so don't rush to write all this stuff down, because if, it, if I didn't put it on that slide, it's on the individual one. So, if you think about what's going on here, we got not enough dopamine. So we're out of balance. So in your mind, you would say, well, just give them more dopamine. That sounds like a great idea. Turns out that our body likes its own dopamine better. So when we give it dopamine, that particular medicine, which is cinnamon, carbidopa, levodopa, um, tends to have more side effects. And we'll talk about those in just a minute. But, so we try to use things that will increase our body's dopamine. A dopamine agonist stimulates the dopamine receptors. Though, remember my synapse and my receptors sitting over here waiting for that neurotransmitter. Like a catcher, waiting to get it, okay? This, these medications make that receptor site think it's dopamine. Grabs it, sends a message, just like it was dopamine but it's not, and they figure it out, so they have some side effects from that. The levodopa carbidopa, levodopa is the dopamine derivative. The carbidopa is needed to get that to cross the blood-brain barrier. And then the levodopa is transformed into dopamine. So it's not the body's dopamine. And long-term use, higher doses, 
it develops symptoms. They start having the hallucinations and other problems that we'll talk about in a minute. Meals help to increase absorption. Now, remember that little enzyme that was sitting down here? Going up there and getting rid of the neurotransmitters. COMT and MAOI. Inhibitors of that enzyme block that destruction so more natural dopamine is left over. Uh, dopamine receptor agonists, again, promote dopamine being um, accepted at the receptor sites. It's your own dopamine. Uh, there's an antiviral drug, a metadine, and then an anticholinergic, which not used with elderly patients unless uh, it, unless it, it just they try not to use this because it causes confusion and it can uh, and it causes dryness. The benzotropine, cogentin, uh, and then there's cholinesterase inhibitors, which is an inhibitor of that acetylcholine, uh, acetylcholine. So let's look at these individually. So dopamine agonists, rapinerol and rotitidine, they stimulate those receptors, they act like dopamine, and the receptors say come on down, and they send the message. So it's like increasing their dopamine. Less wearing off in dyskinesia, less as compared to giving them the sentiment, which we'll talk about next. Some of the adverse effects from this drug, though, are postural hypotension, which we already got problems with falling, uh, hallucinations, and sleepiness. So you do have to watch for those, but they're not as bad, they don't occur as much as you see with the cinnamon, although this is kind of the gold standard, actually, when people get diagnosed with Parkinson's, this is this is not the first drug they'll go to, because this is not fake dopamine, but <laughs> the body knows it's not their own. And the longer you use this, the more trouble they have with downtime, because they'll start having increases in the shaking, the dyskinesia and they'll start having hallucinations. Um, the, I told you that part. Uh, it also, it works really well with motor, but doesn't do a lot for cognition or any of those mental mood changes. So, good drug, but if they start having a lot of hallucinations and the drug is not working and they're having more tremors, they may actually have a drug holiday take the medication doesn't down or completely stop it. My sister's, my friend's sister actually started having hallucinations and her husband, nobody told him about this. And they he took her to the ER and they ended up putting her in a behavioral unit. Well, my friend is a big reader and she didn't find out till the next morning. And uh, she's like, no, it's the medicine. Get her neurologist down there. And that's exactly what it was. She got released and they you know, had, to, had to work their magic with medicine. And the problem, that is a huge problem with these patients because they'll do great for six months and then all of a sudden it's not working as well and they gotta try some new combination. So, um, if I'm not mistaken, I think she's on a patch now that gives it a little more stability, releasing that. Resagaline is a newer drug, and uh, I think that's the one that has the patch. Um, but anyway, these are our inhibitor drugs. They block those enzymes. And tachycone uh, can sometimes be used with cinnamon so that we take less of the cinnamon, but it can cause discoloration of the urine. And then the MAOIs, the inhibitors of the monoamine oxidase, um, its big problem is hypertension, hypertensive crisis, headaches, and, and avoiding foods with tyramine. 
Now, when we talk mental health and we start looking at uh, medications for depression, um, those are SSRIs. They increase dopamine. So you don't need to be mixing those things because you can have um, a uh, neuroleptic malignant syndrome or a serotonin syndrome from too much now the transmitters. But tyramine foods are things like aged foods, pickled meats, uh, red wine, ales, things like that. Beer out of the tap, you know, those, those ones that they're doing, those craft beers now have a lot more uh, wheat and barley and stuff and more tyramine in them. So you have to be careful with those. So these are a little tougher to take because you really have to watch your diet with these. The dopamine agonist promotes release of that dopamine and you can, again, it can be an adjunct therapy. Amantadine uh, helps to decrease our dyskinesia that the patients have. And the cholinesterase uh, inhibitor, rivastigmine, <laughs> um, is helpful with Parkinson's patients if they have dementia because it helps with the dementia also. And that helps to decrease the acetylcholine and bring that balance back down. This is the anticholinesterase, benzodiazepine. Didn't y'all do this drug for voices? Yes, no, uh, Cogitin, yeah. It is anticholinergics, remember, are drying, so they cause retention. But in the elderly, that confusion can be a real problem. They help with tremors and the rigidity, but we can't use them in the older person because of the confusion, the disorientation, they get uh, anxious, they can even have psychotic symptoms. So try to stay away from that. You won't see that use quite as much, and if you do, then you know to watch for those kind of things. So I was talking about a drug holiday earlier. The um, the cinemat, the dopamine agonist, drug tolerance develops and their symptoms get worse. They could have been doing great for months and then all of a sudden you notice that. They might have hallucinations. So you decrease the dose, you change to one of those COMTs, one of those inhibitors or something else that's going to bump the dopamine up. And you may even have to come off of that drug for a 10-day holiday. Okay. All right. So other than meth, we've got some other strategies that can be helpful for these patients. Uh, stereotactic pal pallidotomy, where they actually put a probe in through a burr hole and try to find the tissue that is causing the most tremor, and they laser it and burn it until the patient quits trembling. So yeah, they have to be a little bit awake. Uh, but sedated. Deep brain stimulation, they actually, uh, again, um, through a bar hole, insert electrodes into an area and they have to, um, they, they run a wire down to the chest where there'll be a uh, simulation device, kind of like a pacemaker. Looks like you've got a pacemaker. And they will uh, connect that, get the battery going, connect it to the pulse generator until um, when they turn it on, the patient's tremors reduce. And we're going to look at that in just a minute. Fetal tissue transplantation from human or pig cells, uh, of course, is controversial, but they, they use them to make more dopamine for patients. So, of course, we haven't used aborted fetal tissue in quite a long time, um, but it still is very 
controversial at this time, but it does help some of these nations. All right. So I'm going to show you this guy in just a moment. This first guy was treated with medication. Okay, it's February 22nd, 2013. Um, just a couple questions um, for you, sir. Um, you started having a tremor in 2005, is that correct? That's what our records indicate. Okay, and you've never been on medicine, right? Okay. Let's just do a few tests if you don't mind. Can you tap your left finger for me? As best you can. How about opening and closing them like that? Okay. Let's see you walk a little bit if you can. Yeah, stand a little bit away from you. That's really worked for him. That's Notice he still has that no swing in that right arm. And trying to do two things that other hands started. I mean, obviously, he's lost some weight here, but he's back to eating and stuff. Do all my ADLs and walk and exercise. I'm back in the land of the living. Fantastic. Do they say what type of meds? Drinking water before bed means 46 pounds. Yeah, I wish that was true. Uh, so this guy. <laughs> Drinking water before bed so is 46 pounds <laughs> over the lifetime of your. <laughs> uh, this guy's meds were not as successful with him, but he did deep brain stimulation. I've been healthy in my entire life, no problems with anything. Until 2007, when I was diagnosed with Parkinson's. Tom's Parkinson's disease progressed quickly, bringing with it severe and uncontrollable shaking and flapping of his arms. These involuntary movements left Tom unable to work, to drive, even to feed himself. Uh, so I'm gonna whip forward. Desperate for an answer, Tom came to the University of to one of our top line agents. For Parkinson's disease, the medical program offered at U of M involves careful pre-treatment testing and planning to determine which patients may benefit from this highly complex procedure. Deep brain stimulation surgery is a procedure that occurs in two parts. The first part is the placement of the electrodes, and the second part is the placement of the battery or the pulse generator. So the first part, the placement of the electrodes, is done with patients awake. The reason that it's done that way is that way the patient can be tested in the operating room to see whether the beads are placed correctly to affect their symptoms. There are several ways that we can confirm that the electrode is placed correctly in the operating room. One of the unique features of our program is that uh, I, as a neurologist, am called into the operating room to test the electrodes once they're put in. Uh, by testing it, uh, I turn them on, uh, I set them at uh, clinical settings, and we see if any of the symptoms are improved. And if they are, then uh, that is a guarantee that we are in the right place. 
The second stage is the placement of the battery, and that's done with the patient asleep. And what we do is we then connect a wire from the lead that's in the brain to the battery, which is located here in the chest, and connect down between the two. A couple of weeks after the surgery, we bring the patient back into the clinic, and that's when we turn the stimulator on. Okay, well, let's check your stimulator now. It was instant, like, turn that switch. If it weren't for the deep brain stimulation, I wouldn't be sitting here. So, I'd be fine. I'd be sitting in the it's, on. it's not working for you to come on, but now it starts to diminish. I'll give that up for a half. And you go. For the well-selected patient who's been chosen by a multidisciplinary group and tested carefully, deep brain stimulation can transform their lives. I'm still able to object the heart rate. It was a big boy toy I decided to buy when I found out I was going to have deep brain stimulation. That's my reward. that they develop for Parkinson's patients that, two things, the brake handle, you have to squeeze it together to get it to go. So that if they start to fall, they lose that, the brake goes on. And then they have something to, to grab. The other thing is these walkers were some, for Parkinson's patients, uh, they have some that put a laser line out in front because you know they do this little shuffle thing and we want them to it encourages them to step out with that but it does use a walker and I found this other thing actually Miss White found this this is awesome it's like a little pair of booties Okay. 
that is so cool. <laughs> fundamentals. I want you to brainstorm and fill in the blanks on those slides, those next four or five slides that you have for Parkinson's patients. How do we help that Parkinson's patient with, I think there's a communication, a nutrition, maybe consultation, those things. All right, we'll give you five minutes. You don't have to look anything up, just think about how you take care of your patients. For all four or five of them, I don't know how many blankets there are.
Christina, there's no H in your name. No, ma'am. Oops. <laughs> it's fine. Has everybody gotten their mental health evals? I have. I sent out, maybe because I spelled the thing wrong. Because <laughs> I checked before the test. And okay. It wasn't there yet. I did five and six. Maybe during the test. So it might be there now. Eight, y'all haven't gone yet. But I think Ms. Daniel, Dr. Daniels did orientation, so you should have gotten that. Let me know if you haven't, if it's not there for you. I'll send it again. It's on our email? It comes to your house. It comes to your student email. SharePoint. It'll say. Would you send me your student email and your personal email? Yes, ma'am. And if the student one doesn't go through, I'll send it to you Not that does work great. Right. Um, like some soothing music, sleep yeah. hydration, warm relaxation. Okay. But having a routine. That's what I was trying to get to. Okay. Having a routine of how you go to bed at night. Um, they tend to nap a lot during the day, so their sleep schedule gets way off. So they're going to need some napping, but. Um, but we want to give them enough activity during the day that they're able to go through that routine at night and get some sleep. Okay? So, um, allow them time to speak, the deep breathing, speech therapy. As their muscles, that rigidity gets into their throat muscles and things, they, they talk slower. They don't swallow as well, which is going to lead to another problem. And, you know, we got to be patient. we got to allow them time. Oh, sleep, quiet environment, position of comfort, range of motion helps to decrease their rigidity. They stay awake a lot during the day, so we want them to have some activities. And we want to put them on, on a routine. Maybe lower that mattress down so if they were to fall, this kind of goes with safety. But using a firm mattress, a firmer mattress. Um, avoid using pillows to prevent flexion because they're already kind of stooped over. And elevating the head of the bed some because they do have that increase in drooling and salivation. And they can choke and have respiratory issues also. All right, uh, Nicole, how about uh, 
Nutrition. Um, I can encourage fluid and a high fiber diet and a regular bio training program. Okay, all right. Christina, what'd you have? Um, so I put if um, like if they're doing soups or something that are hard to eat, you could help them if they need help, or try to avoid stuff that are hard to control because of all the chemicals. Yeah, we could shake it. And they now they have the spoons are like forks for the Parkinson's. Yeah, yeah for, they have utensils for Parkinson's patients now. It makes it easier for them. What um, about? Oh, I'm sorry. What about like uh, temperature of the food, like the soup, not too hot. Or not too hot. Yeah. And as they have trouble, you need to check on their swallowing abilities. Uh, they may need to go to thicken foods. They definitely need small portions, small amounts, several times, because it taxes them. It uses up a lot of energy to eat. So if you do small, frequent meals, it's better. Of course, we know about upright for 30 minutes. Um, and check that swallowing. Calorie counts and weekly weights. We want to be sure we're keeping enough weight on them. Suction at the bedside, roughage, fiber, fluids, uh, massage, facial neck and uh, facial and neck muscles before eating because they're tight and rigid and sometimes massage can help relax those throat muscles so they can swallow better. And that's kind of specific for Parkinson's. Whoops, I went ahead and went to this one, but elimination, constipation, big problem. Nicole's already told us they need to be drinking a lot of fluids. you got to be careful and watch. Be sure they're swallowing. Always assess their swallowing. Fiber, um, mobility, get them moving around so that the peristalsis works, and they may need to be on some stool softening. As I said earlier, independence, but don't let them get frustrated. Give them a time limit. If you've got to take your patient or your family member to the doctor, teach the family members to not schedule appointments at 830 because they're not going to be ready to go unless you get them up at 4 o'clock. <laughs> it's going to take them a couple of hours. They're going to be slow. I wouldn't schedule anything before 10 o'clock or you're not going to make it. And they're going to get frustrated and you're going to get frustrated. Uh, give them time to do as much as they can on their own. All right. Questions about Parkinson's? Awesome. I know I've only got seven minutes, but I'm going to tell you about migraines real quick. How many, how many of y'all have had migraines? After taking that test. <laughs> <laughs> that was a stress headache. Oh shoot, I ended it. That is different. <laughs> and we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about three different types of headaches. Migraines, stress headaches, and cluster headaches. Uh, there are other things that can cause headaches. Women during hormonal times, hormone changes, uh, low blood sugars, sinuses. Oh, I get those. Alcohol, never get those. Stress, get that a lot. Maybe after the test today. Need to determine the cause of the headache because we're going to do things differently. You know, people think every headache that's really bad is a migraine and that if they have migraines, they need to go in and get some opioids or something to get rid of. Worst possible thing. Opioids, after a while, if you use those to treat a migraine, you'll have rebound headaches. And they'll start causing your headache to get worse. And we'll look at that. But migraines are a debilitating headache. I mean, they can put you down. Uh, all you want to do is go to your room, close the door, get in the dark, put a cool rag on, let it go away. These are what's called true vascular headaches because it all has to do with vasodilation, vasoconstriction. The neuronal vessels and the, the nerves and the vessels at the base of the skull 
react to some sort of stimuli. Um, I had migraines when I was in my 30s, and mine was uh, red wine, and which broke my heart, but I found a way around it, and uh, chocolate. And I could open a bottle of wine and instantly tell that's going to give me a headache because my symptoms would. What happens is your body reacts by cerebral vessels will vasoconstrict. And the brain says, oh, no, 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 I need oxygen. And so then it reacts by massively vasodilating and causing an inflammatory reaction. So natricin can help. Insects can help, but we know those are not good for our kidneys, not good for a lot of things, so you have to be careful with that. But because um, it will help with the inflammatory end of it. But it's that massive vasodilation that causes that throbbing pain of a migraine. And you see, an opioid doesn't do a thing for that. Doesn't affect it. Now, it, you know, it may take a little bit of ease off, but it's not really going to do much to make that better. Genetic, hormonal, environmental, little combination of all of them. And it's usually unilateral, the throbbing pain. A lot of patients get nausea. Wow, it must have just hit 305. <laughs> or, or did y'all have to turn the page? Oh, that's okay. Oh, okay. It looked like <laughs> 10 people were like, okay, you're done. <laughs> <laughs> we can't eat. <laughs> I got three minutes left. <laughs> um, you do become sensitive to light, sound, movement. Like I said, you just want to go lay down, stay away from me. And uh, let me just work through this. It can last for days. It never failed when my family was going somewhere on a big vacation and I had to pack all three of those youngins and their daddy. <laughs> I, you know, we get, we, I, everybody's in the car and boom. Well, that was a stress headache actually. But uh, there's lots of different, we're going to talk about differences with that. But it, stress can bring on a migraine also, can be that trigger. So women do seem to be affected a little more. It is familiar. Uh, my mom had migraines. But I kind of outgrew mine, and most people, they, they diminish in number as you get older. Now, there are atypicals, but most migraines, either you have an aura or you don't. I always thought an aura was great. <laughs> Although it wasn't pleasant because mine, I would get, uh, my peripheral vision would get really blurred. And I thought I was having a stroke before I figured out what was going on for the longest. And, but I ended up, I was having so many migraines, I ended up doing a diary to see what was I doing when these things came on? Did I have any warning? And it ended up that, yeah, I did have warning, that was it. And if I, <laughs> this is terrible, but if I could get a goodie powder and a high test coat, I could knock that booger out, <laughs> you know, before it got bad. But only about 25% of people have auras. Um, and the rest of them, um, unfortunately, just boom, there comes that headache. Now, auras can be, uh, I've heard people tell me they have cravings for sweet stuff the day before, or they get tingling around their mouth. Uh, a lot of people have the peripheral vision issue or they'll start to smell funny things. Affects people differently. But um, migraines you have to think of as vascular. Stress headaches are muscle. Tight muscles. Does that make it sound good? It is three or four. So we're going to stop here so that I have a minute to tell you that I want you to look through the rest of these PowerPoints. We have two hours to finish Module G next week. <laughs> so I'm going to be pumping it, trying to get through everything. So I'm going to want y'all to know what the heck I'm talking about. Already have looked. Fill in any blank slides. I'm pretty sure I probably left you some. Um, I do not have, I have, this was number two, I have a number three, 
And number four will be the Gillian Moran uh, trigeminy and Bell's palsy. I'll get that up over the weekend as quick as I can this week. If I can do it Thursday, that's my goal. So please prepare. I'll try to get that prep sheet up because, you know, we do two hours and then Dr. Daniels has got an hour. I will see my group tomorrow. Y'all have a great first day in clinical. Yeah. I'm going right now to try to start working on on Alice's on the test. It's so great. People, they walking out of here like they ain't too happy. Uh,